Welcome to the Nexus 2 Help Guide. This session details the mark positions and subject measurements required to effectively use the Plug and Gate AI labeling template in Biomechanical Model. In this guide, we will first look at setting up the subject properly within Nexus. Next, we will look at the markers that comprise this template and where to actually place them on the body. Lastly, we will look at the subject parameters which are used to calculate segmental inertial properties and joint center locations. When setting up your subject, make sure you are in the Subjects tab within the Resources pane. Down below you will see that there are three icons for creating your subject. These will only be active so long as you are in an active session. For more information on how to create a session, please see the video on Pro Eclipse. In this video, I'm going to select the middle button, which is to create a subject from a labeling skeleton. Clicking on this will actually bring up two types of templates. The first, which are denoted using the Nexus icon, or any of the default templates that are installed with Nexus. The second is any custom templates which are denoted using this other symbol. In this video, I am going to use the Plug and Gate Full Body AI. The AI, which stands for Auto Initialize, helps to differentiate it from Nexus One templates. When I select it, I am prompted to enter in a subject name. By default, it's going to select the subject name that was put into Pro Eclipse, so I can go ahead and change it here if I want to, or leave it as is. When selected, I'm going to see my subject name, the template, and an asterisk. The asterisk denotes that this subject has yet to be saved. Either that or changes have been made to the template or the model, and those have yet to be saved. To see the marker list, I'm going to go ahead and expand on the subject and then expand on the marker list. Here I will see all the markers which comprise the template, and right now they're all going to be in gray. And that's because none of the, the labels have actually been applied to any markers on the screen. If I want to see any of the parameters or anthropometric measurements that are required for this template or model, I'm going to go ahead and highlight the name and we'll see them down below. Now let's outline the markers that comprise this template and discuss the appropriate placement of these markers on the body. We will go through this marker list in segments. The first four markers are on the head. The left and right front head need to be placed at the temple. With the head in the anatomical position, these markers will help to define the transverse plane. If these posterior markers on the head cannot be placed level, we can account for this when running the model. The next five markers in blue are on the thorax. Three of these are located posteriorly. The C7 is the largest and most inferior vertebra in the neck. From there, you can palpate these spinous processes and count down to the T10. There is also a right back marker which is placed on the right scapula and is used to provide asymmetry in the template to help distinguish between left and right. On the anterior thorax, there is a clavicle marker which will be placed at the jugular notch where the clavicle meets the sternum and a sternum marker which will be located on the xiphoid process. Next, we will move to the left arm. The left shoulder marker should be placed at the acromioclavicular joint. Before placing the left upper arm marker, First place the left elbow marker on the lateral epicondyle. Now imagine a line between the shoulder joint center and the left elbow marker. Estimate the midpoint and place the left upper arm marker slightly distal to this. This distance can just be the diameter of a marker and should not be over exaggerated. Next place the two wrist markers. Left wrist A is on the thumb side and left wrist B is on the pinky side. These can either be placed directly on the skin through the flexion extension axis of the wrist or on a bar resting on the posterior part of the wrist parallel to the flexion extension axis. Now place the left forearm marker slightly distal to the midpoint between the left elbow and the left wrist joint center using the same strategy as the left upper arm marker. Lastly, place the left finger marker just proximal to the middle knuckle on the left hand. The next set of markers is for the right arm this has the same landmarks as the left arm. However, for the right upper arm and right forearm markers, they should be placed slightly proximal to the midpoint between each segment to introduce asymmetry in marker placement, which will allow the labeling algorithm to more easily distinguish between the left arm from the right. The next segment is the pelvis, or the root of the subject. The two ASI markers will be placed on the anterior superior iliac spine, and the two PSI markers will be placed on the posterior superior iliac spine, immediately below 
the sacroiliac joints at the point where the spine joins the pelvis. Next, we have the left leg markers. Begin first by placing the left knee marker on the lateral side of the knee in the axis of flexion extension. Have the subject passively flex and extend the knee to better determine this location. Now imagine a line between the hip joint center to this knee marker. Locate the midpoint of this line and place the left thigh marker just distal to this point. It is important that this marker lie as closely to this line as possible because the hip joint center, left thigh, and left knee markers will help form a plane from which the cord function is used to help calculate the knee joint center. If the left thigh marker is off, then there will be crosstalk between the three components of the knee angle. Similarly for the shank, start by placing the left ankle marker on the lateral malleoli in the flexion extension axis. Determine the midpoint of the imaginary line between the left knee and ankle markers and place the tibia marker slightly distal to this midpoint. Again, the cord function will be used to determine the ankle joint center. The left heel marker should be placed on the calcaneus at the same height above the plantar surface of the foot as the toe marker. This toe marker should be placed over the second metatarsal head on the midfoot side of the equinus break between the forefoot and the midfoot. If these markers cannot be placed level, the model can account for this. Lastly, we have the right leg markers. These markers will be placed at the same anatomical landmarks as the left leg markers. However, the right thigh and right tibia markers will be placed slightly proximal to the midpoint between their segments as opposed to slightly distal as it was done on the left side. Again, this helps introduce some asymmetry into the model so that the labeler has a better chance to distinguish between left and right. Now that we have the markers to fix properly, the subject parameters must be measured in input. The model only requires those parameters that are highlighted in pink to be input. The first two, body mass and height, are measured using conventional methods and are used to help generate segmental inertial properties. Just note the units for each measurement. Body mass is in kilograms and height is in millimeters. Next we see that we have the left and the right sides sectioned apart. The definition for each measurement are the same for each side. The first three relate to the lower body. For leg length, use a soft tape measure and measure the distance between the asis marker and the medial malleolus. For the knee and ankle widths, use calipers to measure the medial lateral distance across the joint's flexion extension axis. If possible, measure these both with the subject standing. The last measurements relate to the upper body and all require the use of calipers. The shoulder offset is the vertical offset from the base of the shoulder marker to the shoulder joint center. The elbow width is measured as the distance between the medial and lateral apocondyles of the humerus. The wrist width is the anterior posterior distance of the wrist at the position where a wrist marker bar is attached. If the wrist markers were attached directly to the skin, then this value should be set to zero. Lastly, hand thickness is measured as the anterior posterior thickness between the dorsum and palmar surfaces of the hand. As you can see here, there are options for other parameters. These will be calculated. If you physically enter a value, this will supersede any calculated parameters, so make sure not to enter any values erroneously. If you have any questions on the unrequired calculated parameters, please contact support either by phone or email, which will be shown at the end of this video. Thank you for watching this video. As always, if you have any questions about your hardware or software, please do not hesitate to contact us at support at vicon.com.